We're working. Welcome back, everybody. Um, so this is a, uh, a rapid session that we've put together, and we've been working closely with Jonathan and the team to um, make sure this is as broad and as interesting as we can make it. Um, naturally, with such a, a fascinating and, and recent relevant topic, uh, there are lots of questions, lots of opinions, lots of perspectives, and lots of expertise. Um, so there are a great many people um, who will be participating and, and could. This is uh, some of our experts up on here on stage. We will be taking a handful of questions. If you would like to ask a question, I'll be standing uh, on this side of the stage uh, and you can come up and we'll, we'll form a, an orderly line. There will not be um, an, a full hour's worth of questions, so we'll, we'll keep it a little bit themed and threaded. Uh, but come and have a chat to me on the side. We will facilitate questions to be asked throughout the panel. Uh, and then uh, anything that runs over time, I'm sure these discussions will go on for more than just LCA. So I'll hand over to Jonathan to introduce our panelists and we'll get this show on the road. Thank you. All right, thank you all for coming. Bear with us a bit. This whole panel was organized pretty much the way the whole response to Meltdown and Spectre were organized. <laughs> Which is why it wasn't on the schedule until this morning. The embargo only broke, finally, um, a few hours ago. Anyway, um, I'm John Corbett. I've been kind of keeping an eye on this whole thing for a little while, writing a bunch of wrong stuff on the internet about it. And um, I thought it would be interesting to get a group of folks together to talk about how this, this whole episode impacted our community and how we've responded to it. I really want to focus more on that than on the, the gory technical details of it because I think there are better places to, to dig into the details of how you would actually exploit Variant 2 if you want to do that, or something like that. So um, I, don't, I don't see us really going in that direction. Got together a bunch of people with a very wide variety of interesting viewpoints on all of this, so I'd like to start by just asking each of our panelists to, to introduce themselves to the group, then we'll start into the questions. Um, do think about questions that you may have, because Often what, what the audience wants to know is sometimes the most interesting stuff. I would ask that if you come up that you do actually have a question. Um, there are other places to express opinions on how all this stuff worked out. Uh, um, so, Jess? Uh, I'm Jesse Frizzell. Uh, I work at Microsoft, and I'm also on the security team for Kubernetes, and I've done a few things with containers. <laughs> <laughs> Um, my name is Ben O'Rice. I'm a FreeBSD developer and core team member. Um, I also work for iX Systems, uh, who uh, develop the FreeNAS and TrueNAS products, among other things. Um, hi, I'm Case Cook. I work at Google. I do a lot of uh, upstream kernel um, security work. Um, I found out about this ahead of embargo, so I have some background in that area. Sorry, the mic's really awful. OK. Is that any better? Okay. You need to repeat your introduction. Do I need to repeat? Yeah. Okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, my name is Case Cook. Uh, I work at Google and I focus on upstream kernel security work. Um, I found out about this ahead of embargo, so I have uh, some more knowledge about how things uh, played out there. Hi, I'm Katie. I'm an SRE at Divio, which is a hosted Django CMS platform. And I did not find about, uh, out about anything until the embargo accidentally happened. So I've been having fun. I'm, uh, I'm Bunny. I try not to write too much code because I make hardware and I break hardware. Um, but uh, I happen to have maybe a little bit of perspective from the inside guts. All right, well, I would like to start just by talking a little bit about the, the impact that it had on our community, in particular, how each of us had to respond to this as it came out, and perhaps in terms of how the way these vulnerabilities were handled impacted your particular group, your particular constituency, and if you have thoughts on maybe how things could have been done better, those, those would be useful as well. So I'll start again with, with, with Jesse. There was like a lot of confusion with when it first came out and um, the lack of knowledge around how containers work kind of uh, had us fielding a lot of requests as to if containers are going to save you from a hardware bug, which the answer is no. Um, so yeah, there was a lot of that. Um, I think maybe it, 
a way to fix it in the future would obviously be not having uh, an absolute shit show of an embargo. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much all I can come up with. <laughs> Um, from the FreeBSD perspective, our primary gripe is that despite having relationships with a lot of the, the vendors involved, we didn't find out until very, very late in the piece. And so we had, I think, 11 days between when we were told from when the embargo stopped um, to develop, you know, oh, nothing small like kernel page table isolation or something like that. Um, which, you know, I don't sort of sheet back to any kind of uh, malice or nastiness on anyone's part. You know, this is the kind of thing that hopefully only happens once in a lifetime. Um, <laughs> uh, everything's wonderful. Um, <laughs> and, you know, I'm, I'm just hoping that we can learn a bunch of things about how the disclosure process worked this time to do better next time. I thought it was pretty interesting within Google even it was pretty well contained, not a lot of people knew about it. Um, so when I did find out about it, I was pretty constrained with who I could talk to about it. So trying to make sure that everyone who needed to know about it got through some approval process to learn about it um, proved to be uh, somewhat difficult. Um, but I, I don't know why it's not working. What? Let's carry on with the handheld model. Okay. Um, so getting people involved uh, in late October when Kernel Summit happened uh, was part of where I was trying to make sure we had more uh, visibility within the, the x86 maintainers, for example, uh, making sure all the right people were, were involved. And from, from there on, uh, it seemed to accelerate pretty well. Yeah, um, <coughs> is my mic working? No? Uh, no. Oh. We're just going to pass the handheld down. Um, so. From my standpoint, I only first heard about it when I saw the wonderful SVGs turn up on Twitter. So trying to work out a response as a platform provider was an interesting experience and we're still not 100% back to how things were. But it's it's been really great because we've had no major complaints from any of our customers. Everyone's been understanding. And thankfully, in the position that I'm in, we don't host really human life critical systems. So it hasn't been the end of the world for us, but that may not apply to everyone who's had to handle this thing. Is your mic working? Um, yeah. <laughs> to, the, to the point of feedback. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't uh, work particularly with any Linux subcommunity, but I work with the hardware guys. And um, I have to say that I do feel quite a bit for the engineers who worked on the, on the chips, um, because people demand more and more performance all the time. It's, a, it's an arms race to get there very quickly, and the thing that was exploited was you know, a thing that was involved in getting you good performance um, on those devices. And um, it would be interesting to see how things play out um, particularly, you know, I, I, there's going to be some, probably some class action lawsuit against Intel. It's going to be massive because the FDIV bug itself was like something like $400 million for a Pentium back in the day. You can scale it up to what it might look like for Intel now. And then um, what the response will be in terms of, well, this is absolutely why we should keep everything closed because, you know, it's really expensive if you guys found out about our bugs that we have to ship in our hardware that's been there for years and years and years. Um, so it'll be, uh, it'll be interesting to see how that all plays out and how that interacts with the, you know, the, the chip designers and their sort of paranoid mentality about uh, sharing documentation. Okay, well, I'll say once again that if there, there must be someone in the audience with questions. You can talk to Jack if you do, go over there. He's not as mean as he looks. Uh -huh. And if, if I have to go to the bottom of my list of questions, we're gonna be in bad shape. So <laughs> while, while you're thinking about that and heading over there, and while they fix the feedback. I would like to just ask the panel what we think about, what this says about embargoes in general and the embargo process. I've heard people saying that the embargoes made things worse in this case. Certainly the embargo led to a situation of haves and have-nots where some people knew about the problem and were able to respond ahead of time. Other communities were left completely out in the cold 
and are still scrambling to respond to it and don't really have an effective response to it as a result. Um, does anybody have thoughts on, on whether embargoes are still the right thing to do for, for the handling of bugs like this? Um, I would say that I do actually think that embargoes serve a purpose on a, on, a, on a bunch of fronts. I think that the problem that we have is that, especially in a situation like this, uh, it, it, it leads you into this kind of panic mentality where it's like, we must keep this as quiet as possible and so we're not going to tell people. But then you've also got people with patches going into, like, the fact that people worked out what was going on because some people were making a performance degrading patch to the Linux kernel and Linus wasn't complaining about it. I thought that, 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 that was a lovely bit of irony out of the whole thing. Um, but I just think there needs to be some kind of consistency in that, and that's hard to do when you don't have any kind of coordinative body that handles a lot of these kind of disclosure processes. Yeah, I thought it was, um, a lot of people talk about how the embargo was you know, a complete disaster, and from my perspective, um, it seemed like notification internally during the embargo is where most of the problem was, but the embargo itself was relatively successful and only broke six days early from something that started in June the year prior um, and getting a lot of people involved on what was, you know, this is one of the most complex uh, things to mitigate uh, in software since it is a hardware bug. Um, I, I thought that was relatively successful and the things that could be developed in, in the open uh, were developed in the open, and, and um, that seemed pretty. That seemed to go pretty well. Uh, people knew something was going on, obviously, from what you'd said. <laughs> it's like, wow, Linus is happy with this. Something is terribly wrong. Um, <laughs> but uh, it, I don't know. With only people were supposed to be ready on January 9th, and so it went a little bit early, uh, and that created a bit of a scramble, but. From my perspective, it's like, yeah, but what if this broke in July? Like, we'd have nothing at all. It would be, it would be months trying to get it fixed. Yeah, I think there is like, um, I do agree that it was done well for that time frame. That's absolutely insane that no one like started rumors about it. Uh, but it seemed like there was kind of a decision that like some cloud providers know and some don't. So like it's almost very sad that the small cloud providers, um, like I think DigitalOcean and those, they were like, wait, what's going on? And they actually like pay for hardware. So I'm unsure exactly what happened there, but it seems to be like an exclusive club as to whether you know or don't know. And it's not really clear the lines of who should be informed. In fact, LWN is hosted on a tier two provider like that, and they're still scrambling to, to be ready for it. There, there was, there's definitely you know, two tiers of, of information sharing here. And I, I'd hate to see a, a world where only the very biggest cloud providers have access to information about something like this. Because you know that that's a competitive. It's also the fact that it's the largest customers of Intel products that get the first tr drops from Intel, and as community projects that don't have a specific vendor relationship with Intel, um, that puts us kind of on a uh, dunno list. Okay, looks like we have some questions. Thank you much. We certainly do, and I might kick off. Actually, I might jump ahead because it's uh, very much on the topic. Yeah, so um, Jesse kind of preempted my question, which was originally going to be for Katie, um, around exactly that topic. As a small provider, you, I'm, the disclosure process doesn't seem to have gone out beyond a relatively small group of big players. How's that affected you? How do you think this could be made better to avoid splitting into a real have-haves-nots, crippling companies like yours in the, mar you know, in, in, in the market. Do you have any sort of comment, thoughts on that? Is my, oh uh, yeah, I'm working. Um, so those six days were really important um, because we were running on an operating system that still doesn't have the entire set of patches, but we were able to operate on a case of, oh, this thing has happened. We were able to flick some switches to just disable a whole bunch of access for a whole bunch of different things in our system really quickly, which was really, really useful. Um, so most of our um, hosted platform sites were still up. They were just in an uneditable state. 
So unless you already had a particular way to get access and exploit this particular bug, you couldn't add any more code, which is fine, but it made everything read only. So, but we were still up, so no one died, which is great. Um, but yes, yeah, just, I'm not sure how that kind of thing would scale because, I mean, sure, you've got um, Heroku and that who were able to, because they have such a large team, I believe they were rolling out their own uh, compile cut kernels within a couple of days. But then you have smaller providers who are just waiting for the upstream patches that still haven't come. But the, the exponential nature of this sort of thing, I'm not exactly sure where you can expect this kind of thing to stop. Um, I don't have a good answer. Okay, so if, I'm, if somebody's in the market to buy some new hardware and they want to avoid this and they want to avoid the performance hit of the patches, does buying AMD or OpenPower or something else help? I might like to redirect that question just a little bit because I don't want to be saying we should buy, be buying any particular manufacturer's um, products because everybody has had problems with, with all of this. So I don't, I don't think that's quite the right way to look at it. But it, it does hint on something else I wanted to, to touch on, which is what about more open hardware? Can we maybe fix some of this stuff by going to more open architectures that we can perhaps more directly review the designs ourselves and um, influence and so on. Is, is, is that a path to salvation for this kind of thing? Because some people have been saying that, and it's an appealing idea. You know, I, I, I have an opinion on that. <laughs> 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 I, actually, unfortunately, I think in the case of this uh, particular bug, all the things, all the ingredients that were necessary to make it happen were actually publicly disclosed information. We all know that um, speculative execution occurs. We all know there's timing side channels. Um, one of my favorite uh, quotes from Seymour Cray was that uh, memory is like an orgasm. It's better when we don't have to fake it. And <laughs> every single time that you go and you try to fake some bit of performance, you're going to have a timing side channel. And that's pretty much essential. Now, if you actually look at sort of the guarantees there in the ISAs, um, they don't necessarily guarantee anything about the timing. Oftentimes, even the clock count of instruction is not really settled in these, in these, in these ISAs. So these are going to exist. And it's not like open hardware manages to walk around the laws of physics, and we can, we can retire instructions in exactly the right amount of time, and we don't have to speculate. We don't have to do these sorts of things. So unfortunately, I think that for this class of bugs, it's not gonna, it wouldn't have necessarily saved anybody. It will save you from other types of problems. There's a whole class of things that exploits in hardware that haven't even been disclosed yet that are just waiting to come out. And uh, you could be saved from them by being able to review the register sets and find out that like, there's aliasing bits and that people have like hidden stuff inside, you know, debug registers and whatnot, and all the pre-boot pre -boot code that runs before you even get to the reset point uh, vector and all that sort of stuff, and the fuses that are set to disable blocks and turn on things. All these things that you don't even know about that are inside the processors, um, you would be able to find about and review and be like, holy cow, that's really scary. Um, but this particular one probably would not have been helped by open hardware, unfortunately. Okay, then related to that, there's been a, a real effort in the software community towards reproducible builds. The idea that you can know that the, the executable you're running actually did come from the source that it claims to be from. Mm -hmm. How do we do reproducible builds in more open hardware? You mean in terms of like that this piece of silicon is based upon the code that we, we claim it to be, it doesn't have a back door or something like this inside of it? Yeah, that it actually matches the, the designs that are published for it. Yeah, that's really hard too. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the, the fundamentally, I mean, there's been some papers on stuff like um, uh, doping attacks on the, like the threshold of transistors that allow you to bias the way things reset one way or the other. And those you can't even detect with a, with a visual inspection. You actually have to go at it with like a X-ray diffraction scope or you have to dissolve away the chips to, the, to actually get into the core components of the, the dopants. Um, and so in terms of like, yes, I have, a, I have a piece of RTL and I turn in this net list and it looks like this on silicon that doesn't even necessarily protect you in terms of like a, that level of reproducible build that you're looking for. 
Um, and even, even like, for example, uh, you know, um, the guys at Sci-Fi who are trying to do open hardware, um, I've been complaining to them you know, that you go to their GitHub repo and I'm like, there isn't actually a, a, you know, the source for the chip that they're shipping. They have the FPGA target and then the actual source for the chip they're shipping isn't actually something you can pull and look at. And it's because there's a lot of complications in terms of NDAs with like the sub vendors and, and bits and pieces, like little tiny blocks they couldn't like get around in terms of getting them open. Um, and you know, that becomes a problem in and of itself for the community. So what you're saying is that everything's wonderful. <laughs> I mean, it's a, what I'm saying, it's an extremely hard problem. And I know that what people want to solve, and I know that, that we need to keep on working towards this. But the fact of the matter is that uh, we build chips with gates that are a few atoms wide now, right? And that's really insanely hard to do. And, um, the, uh, and then sort of software people have the luxury of being able to pull everything from source. You can build your compilers from source. You can build your kernels from source. We can't build fabs from source, right? It's just like, until we reach the day where you can start to build fabs from source, you're not gonna have that same level of like transparency down to the bottom. As far back as 1995 or even earlier, researchers were warning about the dangers of speculative execution as a side channel and were either ignored or the risks were not properly understood. It's reasonable to assume that the same thing is happening today in our industry. Somewhere, someone understands that something that we're doing is inherently risky, uh, and they may be being ignored, or the magnitude of the danger is not understood. As an industry, how can we make sure that these people are heard and understood? Well, that's a question and a half. <laughs> <laughs> I might start by ans answering that by saying that there are people out there who are warning us that programming in C is inherently risky and is going to lead to all kinds of <laughs> security problems or um, allowing people to input data into web uh, that gets published on the web pages is we have to do risky things at times but we don't really get very far. So, um, you know, to say we shouldn't be doing speculative execution seems seems throwing the baby out with the bathwater yeah. would be my, my impression, but maybe someone else has a different thought? Um, I think it's, uh, I think this serves as a good example of uh, having people pay attention to the more paranoid individuals um, who, are, who are talking about these problems. Um, because, you know, we've, we've understood timing side channels for a long time, but there wasn't uh, what you could consider a practical attack uh, using them. So, you know, th the research on this built up and built up until a whole bunch of people all realized the same thing around the same time. Um, and having that in mind and trying to keep that uh, at the forefront when you hear someone say, I think this might be a problem. You know, uh, historically, people are just kind of like, eh, but that's an impractical attack. It's like, yeah, but. Maybe I'm not smart enough to find the practical attack, but it might still be there. Someone else might have found it. Um, and just keeping that in mind when you, when you hear those kinds of things, you're like, well, okay, what could we do to defend against this that you know, is, is, a, is an acceptable level of, of change or whatever, um, trying to be more uh, self-protective in that way. As a, as a hardware engineer, I find it insane that you guys think that you can run secrets with non-secrets on the same piece of hardware. <laughs> um, so there is still um, space to my right if anyone has questions. Um, there was a, a very interesting uh, tweet as a question, um, and that was to, to start to explore what criteria do we use to, to uh, invite in and out of that, that disclosure circle. And the reference being with uh, the Drupal community and Drupal Geddon, it was a period of seven hours before there were exploits in the wild. And how do we, how do we choose those tier one, those tier two, et cetera, for the best outcome? I guess I can start by um, saying that we, we do actually have mechanisms for, for disclosure within the community that have, solved a number of these problems, at least for most of the, 
of the issues that we've had. It's not perfect, but it works fairly well. Those mechanisms were not used this time around. It was, the disclosure process was handled very differently. Why? Um, I don't actually have an answer to that. Um, I'm not sure anybody who's up here can, maybe. I, I think the only, the, I've thought about that a lot, um, given the frustration in getting people notified, and I think the, uh, the existing systems were for software vulnerabilities. And in the case of hardware vulnerabilities, it's not as well, uh, it's, it's not done as much. It hasn't happened a lot. Um, an example preceding this, um, where we had uh, similar efforts, uh, was with Rowhammer. Um, and things were really awkward there too. Um, so doing, having a tested disclosure mechanism for hardware vulnerabilities is still unfortunately relatively new, and it's uh, at least currently still somewhat rare. Um, so improving that, I think, is where we need to look to the future. And that's also the, the line that I've been taking as with my FreeBSD core team hat on talking to various groups. Uh, for instance, I emailed um, some of the people in Project Zero and said, you know, if you ever come across anything that send, makes you go to your Linux engineers and say, start patching this, maybe could you just, you know, drop us a little hint? Um, <laughs> Because, yeah, and, and I, I kind of see where, it, it, where hardware disclosures look a bit different to software disclosures, but then, you know, in a lot of ways, I think there's the, the mechanisms should work reasonably similarly because it impacts a different subset of the same larger group of people. It's still something that has to be fixed in software. And it's still something that has, crosses communities and still, and, you know, people need to have a a response ready in time, which is what the embargo is meant to do, is meant to keep it quiet from the entire world so that a small subset of the world can get their, their stuff in order, so that when, when the uh, stuff hits the rotating thing, everything's, everyone is as most ready to get as they can be. Um, but that didn't work in this way, this case. So is there maybe some help here? I want to ask the containers folks, because part of the idea of of running on containers might be encapsulated in a response that Alan Cox had when this first came out. He said that if your provider has, doesn't have a fix deployed for this, it's time to exercise that plan that you most certainly have to, to move when your cloud provider suddenly fails on you. Um, so were people able to do that and did it help them? Uh, yeah, I mean, the main selling point of Kubernetes and containers is that you have no vendor lock-in so you can easily move from you know, the major cloud providers that provide Kubernetes. Um, I do not know if anyone actually used that, um, but I do know that a lot of people loved that the upgrade process for their kernel was easier because um, one of the great things about containers and orchestrators in general is that you can move things off of one node to another, upgrade, and you get zero downtime. So um, that's kind of cool. <laughs> yeah, that, that's what we were able to do in some AWS regions. We were able to, uh, spin up a new environment with a different operating system, one that happened to have all the entire patches, and then just move everything across. But that was a whole of our own mechanisms, but we were also relying on AWS there, and that functionality isn't available on every region. So we still have some regions that are read-only and some regions that are now fixed again. But yeah, containers are cool in some aspects, but they still need to run on hardware. Yeah, <laughs> sadly. Yeah. <laughs> That hardware thing's a real pain. <laughs> Sorry, guys. See, people keep on talking about the cloud. So that's like not hardware, right? Yeah. Serverless. We should all be serverless. So buffer overflows were a thing in the 70s we knew about as, as bugs. And then some point in the 90s, they started becoming serious security problems. And they became all the security problems. We had a great wave of them. Heartbleed came out. And then we had a sudden wave of open SSL family-related attacks. Is Spectre and Markdown, just the first salvo of the next 20 years of our lives being hell. And <laughs> how do we mitigate against that, both from a hardware manufacturing perspective and from a having to deal with the consequences perspective about hey, this hardware's here and we can't replace it for three years having to live with it? I can speak a little bit to the, the software mitigation side of that was that the, uh, the PTI patch sets were, were seen as a gigantic hammer that would fix a bunch of side channels um, by, by trying to separate those page tables because it addresses a wide range of different vulnerabilities. Um, so the hope was with the three variants, there was 
there was an expectation that there would be further variance because there would be more research by more people and we'd see this slowly expanding. And the hope was that A, um, the, the meltdown mitigations would cover some of that as well without knowing what they were in a, ahead of time. Um, and if not, we'd find some, we'd have had, we'd have had practice mitigating um, side channel attacks. Um, so from the software side. I also know that um, like timing side channels on, on cache has been a, a, an attack surface for a while. Uh, Colin Percival did some work years and years ago on uh, hyperthreading where he showed that that would leak information across. And so, you know, the, I think the, the interesting thing in this one is that they, they combined the speculative execution aspect with it. But I think what that basically means is that all, all these performance optimization optimizing parts of your CPU are now an attack surface that everyone's going to be looking at very, very, very carefully for a while. So, Buddy, do you think that these vulnerabilities and others like them are going to drive changes in hardware design? Will we see, see defensive designs? I think uh, there are some mitigations, I can imagine, that uh, CPU vendors could put in, but I think that, you, that the system, <coughs> the people who buy them, won't like what it'll do to their performance benchmarks. So it's going to be sort of a, a question of like, do I want the fastest performing thing? Because the, the fastest policy is to trust but verify, right? And be like, of course, you know, this is probably going to be true. And in the very, very rare cases, something's wrong, you roll everything back and you go for it. But then if you start to put checkpoints in the hardware, constantly execution essentially has to slow down. You can do things like whitening. So you can go ahead and like try to like whiten up your um, branch predictors, or you can try to like put a little noise in the system so that the timing side channels are not as reliable. But then you're, incre you're decreasing the performance of the CPU at the same time. You're not getting to that, like, you know, that, that point you want to get to. So the question is, are you willing to take a 2 to 10% to 20% hit in performance for something that has rock solid security? And uh, you know, what does that do to your power budget? What does that do to your cost of maintenance? What does it do to your upgradability and so on and so forth? So in LCA 2007 here in Sydney, Andrew Tenenbaum said that it would be a total mistake to trade security for 20% performance improvement. We'd never want to do that. Instead, it sounds like we're going to be patching for a while. Yeah, yeah. Vulnerabilities uh, like these have an incredibly strong impact on society overall. And yet we're a room full here of reasonably smart, reasonable technical people struggling to understand it. How do we explain things like these to the other people that basically shape our society, like politicians, business people, educators, law enforcement, etc. Fancy logos. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously, the, the fact that like someone on the street could maybe, okay, maybe half league now, but in a couple of months, if Jack were to wear that t-shirt down the street, someone may recognize it. And trying to instill the basic level of patch your stuff is the communication um, platform that we can then build upon. But then all the other fun with it's like, well, it's not just patching. You also need to be vigilant and all this kind of stuff. We can build off that. But people keep on saying, oh, it's not a real vulnerability unless there's a logo. Well, <laughs> name me a vulnerability that doesn't have a fancy logo in the last three years. Exactly. <laughs> I don't know, I mean, in the US, we're having trouble explaining much more fundamental concepts to our politicians at the moment. It's not just the US. It's really not just the US. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, creating a, a greater security awareness in general is something we've been trying for years and years. And, you know, sometimes we succeed a little bit, but we still have issues with, you know, kernel developers getting their laptops compromised and things like that. So I think that we have created a situation where people who are less clued into this really don't have much hope other than do what they're, they're told and hope that it works out as well as it can. I mean, yeah. do we have anything better than that really to offer? I, I talk a little bit about that actually in the, in the talk that I'm going to give just, just now, so I'll keep All right, my, we'll I'll keep my mouth shut. <laughs> <laughs> All right, looks like you got another one here. <clears throat> uh, and we're probably at about the, the eight or nine minute mark, so we've probably got time for possibly one more question after this, and then we'll wrap up with uh, final words. So uh, have people had a look at 
older CPUs perhaps that don't have speculative execution? Because I, I think that the results could be interesting. So I'm not sure I quite answered the question. The question was, are, are we looking at using CPUs without speculative execution entirely? Older. older CPUs. Well, speculative execution, of course, has been a feature of any performance CPU for quite some time. So you have to get pretty old. 46, there, there are, I think. There yeah. are things on the market that I don't, like, does Atom do speculative execution? Yeah, for it sure. Does? Okay. I think you have to go back to 486. I have a 486 in my apartment. Yeah, there. You're safe. <laughs> You're safe. <laughs> so everyone just Put your migrate everything there. onto Jesse's 486. <laughs> we'll all be good. If anyone wants to buy a titanium system, I'm willing to sell. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll type that as a comment. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I think speculative execution is with us. That's just part of, at least until we get rid of the memory bandwidth problem or something like that, that that drives it. And I don't see that right away. We got time for, uh, for some others. All right, well, while they're negotiating, um, <laughs> <laughs> we said, OK. So whilst the panel's focused on the hardware vulnerabilities we've recently faced, what learnings can we take from that back into the software side of the vulnerability process and the disclosure process? Because that's still ongoing. And if anything right now, we're too focused over there and we'll have a new vulnerability appear over here. And we still have issues with that process. So what learnings can we take forward? Yeah, well, that's back to the whole I mean, the disclosure process I mean, and embargoes and all that, which we've sort of touched on. Um, from my perspective, the software vulnerability process is working better for us than the hardware one at the moment. Um, so I'm not saying that the software vulnerability uh, process is perfect, um, but I think, I mean, I think there's a lot to learn from how this one was handled, and I do think that people are learning from it. Um, we've had very positive discussions with the people that you know, didn't notify us in this one about how we can avoid this happening in the next one, because you know, there will be a next one. Um, and so, yeah, I think there's always things to learn when one of these things drops. I actually had just one question for you, you guys. The uh, embargo process, who, who are you actually trying to protect against by embargoing? Are you trying to like, make sure just random script kiddies don't use this, or are you looking to keep like, state-level actors away from trying to exploit every computer in the world? <laughs> My understanding is um. yes. <laughs> <laughs> Protecting against you, is that? <laughs> we're, we're trying to stop this person here from finding out. <laughs> I mean, script kitties, I think, are or last century's problem at this point, right? Yeah. Um, you know, the, the, the capture the flag game that was going on once upon a time has, I think, been superseded by, by much more commercial or, or um, political or military interests. I mean, that's my impression of it. Mm. You know, I've, I've heard rumors of exploits of some of these things having been on the market before all this was, you know, they're, they're just rumors. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, you know, had they been out there for months without a fix, there certainly would have been more of them, I would Possibly, think. Possibly, yeah. I mean, I also just wonder that if you're, if you're actually looking to protect, for example, against state-level actors, those guys may already be listening to your comms. Yeah. And they would have known to exploit the same time you guys would have known it, and then actually just opening up to the whole community to solve the problem, and having us all band together against state-level actors would have been a much par more powerful response than trying to, trying to isolate it in areas which I mean, in my in my point of view, <laughs> in my point of view, the embargo process is is more about allowing vendors to try and have as much of a window as they can to get their response in place before it sure. becomes sure. widely available. And they'll um, have a really good press response to it. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, I, I do think that it sometimes causes harm. If you look at the the mitigations that were deployed when the, the mm -hmm. embargo fell apart, sure. very yeah. few of those survived the process of getting into the mainline Linux kernel, right? Some of them seemingly didn't fix the problems that, that they 
were said that they were going to, right? And what we have upstream is much improved by actually having been part of the community process. And so I think there is an argument for bringing in the community process a lot sooner. That was a rare case where that giant hammer covered so many things that it was, it, it allowed that process. It was clear that it needed to be done in the community. And so there was a fight to start that ahead of the embargo. And the only reason that worked is because there were other things that it covered that we could talk about, but it was quickly obvious by anyone paying attention that it was going to cover something else. But the, the point was that it actually was developed in the open. Um, it just wasn't clear what it was fixing. Um, so that was a weird situation in this, whereas under normal circumstances, all that fixing happens behind closed doors, and then you get a weird embargo and things go sideways. But in this case, it was actually been you know, worked on since the end of October on. Um, so I actually think that worked pretty well, uh, given the severity of the problem. Yeah, that, that worked well for Meltdown. Right, the, the specter mitigations um, were pretty ugly <laughs> as they came out, and they, they improved quite a bit. Well, the moment anyone said speculative execution in public, it was it, done. Yeah. It was done. So those other mitigations couldn't be worked on. It was a really weird position to be in. Okay, Jack, did you have anything else? Uh, no, we must have wrapped up the panel. Yeah, I think that's, that's it. We're just about out of time. So we've got, what, about 40 seconds each for any last thing <laughs> that you would like to say? Um, well, let's just start down at the other end. Yeah, I, I didn't have any final words at the moment. I'll give them to you. Patch your stuff. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's something that still needs to be, like, every time one of these things comes up, I mean, you've got the people that are doing really awesome work trying to get everything patched, but it really depends on people actually applying the patches and upgrading and updating and just instilling that constant vigilance of always making sure you're up to date, because as soon as the patches hit, yeah. And running the latest kernel, which is really hard for a lot of people to do, and this really drove it home. Like, that's oh, really hard to backport this to a 2.6 uh, kernel, <laughs> <laughs> it turns out. Or a 3, or any 4, anyway. Um, one, one perspective I've tried to have in my mind is, uh, you know, once this got disclosed in January, people said, oh my God, this is, this is the worst year. 2018 has started out so badly. I'm like, no, no, no. This was all found. The badness was in 2017. Now we're <laughs> fixing it. So that's, that's the best perspective How I've got. How we rebuild. On. Yes. Um, yeah, I just, um, my only takeaway from, well, my main takeaway from this, apart from like, oh, shiny new things to look at, is, um, that's the positive spin on Meltdown, um, is just, we need to work out how to handle these disclosures better, and that's an ongoing process. We're never going to get it 100% right. We're always going to muck something up, but let's learn from what we can from this and apply it for the next one. Yeah, um, I would just say, Containers sadly won't save you, but they will ease your pain in upgrading. <laughs> right, I'd like to finish with a bit of a plea for the industry, especially the industry involved around this. Normally when an embargo ends, we get timelines, and we get a pretty much a full disclosure of what happened. In this case, there's still a lot of secrecy around what went on with Meltdown and Spectre and how they were handled and exactly what was happening in the three months or so between the initial disclosure and when the Linux kernel community began to hear about it and so on. There are people who have said publicly at this conference they're not even allowed to say the names of, of these vulnerabilities. I would like to see an end to that. I would like the industry to end at least that piece of it so that we can get the whole story out there and figure out how to do better the next time around. That would be my request. So, on that note, I would like to thank our panelists who came together on very short notice to make all this happen. And thanks to everybody who asked questions, and thanks to all of you for being here. And thank you yourself. Another round of applause for our panel. Fantastic. Uh, so, Bonnie, you're up next. Um, we might give you a couple of minutes to, to grab, grab some uh, uh, breather and some water. Um, I'm sure lots of discussions will happen after this session. Please carry them on out in the hallway track uh, if that's the case. And I'm sure our speakers would like to have a breath of, uh, of air and a glass of water before you hound them with questions. Uh, so be kind and uh, we'll see everyone in the hallway track afterwards if you're not staying. Thank you. <laughs>